I'm going to take a liberty and speak for, we, instead of just, me. The second realm is a dream. We don't seek to build the second realm because it is easy. We don't seek to build the second realm because it is practical. We don't seek to build the second realm because success is likely. We will build the second realm because it is right. We will build the second realm because it is necessary. We will build the second realm not only for ourselves but for our posterity. We will build the second realm to preserve our soul. All right, I think uh, I think we're in here. Oh, I'm muted. Okay. All right, I think uh, got it started. Can everyone hear me? Okay. Okay, there we go. Now I'm hearing you. Yes, I gotta... you are. Okay, I gotta let people talk then. Okay, so interesting. Okay. <clears throat> Sorry, guys. Are first you hearing time here. me, Ryo? Um, yes. Okay. Yep, I can hear you. Coming through well. Getting all my settings set up over here. I've n I don't usually do Telegram calls, so um, looks like we're getting we're getting going though. <clears throat> all right, and we'll just. Uh, Hang out here for a minute or two. I know they're uh, definitely waiting on at least Bastard Chris. So um, we'll let people filter in. But yeah, for everyone here, thanks for joining already. And uh, yeah, looking forward to the uh, the second prize on Sigma Assembly. I brought my uh, my friend from the legal side, so he'll be able to give us a little more, um, at least, at least you know, tops of the mountains view of uh, different things. Because I heard some people interested in that as well. So sure. I asked if he'd come give like short descriptions of different legal remedies. Not that anyone's going to be able to do anything with that information, but at least it'll get their, their, uh, pique their interest maybe, and also get them a little more familiar with the types of things they could ask about or search and learn mm -hmm. about. Yeah, certainly, certainly. Um, yeah, well, that'll be, uh, that will be great. And I know that's what Chris kind of wants to talk about too. Um, at least uh, some of those legal topics. So um, that'll be maybe even from a little different perspective. Um, so that'll be fun. Yep. And then Jonathan was uh, just hopped in the Pasnia chat um, He's here. a few minutes ago. Oh, looks like Chris. Yep, Chris just joined. I might have to allow allow to speak for some reason. I'm not sure why I have to do that. But. It's probably kind of good that you have those set up so that people don't unmute themselves. Um, but also, my friend's name is uh, Irish Lakota. You'll need to okay. okay. You'll need to un unmute him too, so that he can control his on mute. Okay. Okay. Understood. And so, is that Chief? Yeah. I think that's Chief. Okay. Yep. And then I'll go ahead and yeah, do it and just do the loud speak for all, and you guys can. Operate your mutes as you like. Much obliged. Hey, welcome, Chief. Glad to see you here. Thank you for having us. Okay, and Chris, uh, can you hear me, sir? Oh, I might have to allow to. Sp okay, there we go. Whoops, I guess I forgot to allow to speak to Chris, so see if we can get him here. Yeah, it looks like he's able to control his own mic now too. Okay, must be might be getting set up or something. And I guess it will. Thing. Can you hear me? Uh, Jonathan. Yep. I yep. Coming through loud and clear. Yep. Okay, and I suppose I will mention just uh, before we even get started, before we get too far into it, that um, I uh, this is a second uh, passing a subgram assembly, and we do uh, you know these are for the you know for the public, so um, yeah. This will be recorded and put out on the Vonnie podcast feed and um, YouTube and Odyssey and all those places. So, okay, let me see. For that, that will definitely alter what I. 
Oh, I gotta turn off those notifications here. That's going to be obnoxious for the listeners if they're listening to the I'd recording. Like to do that too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, one moment. We'll, we'll get we'll I get rolling here in a moment, guys. That. Okay, mute notifications. Uh, mute for three hours should be fine. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Hopefully that works. And yeah, anyone that's, uh, if you just want to join and listen, um, no one, uh, no one will be forced to speak, but you'll obviously have the choice if you desire. <clears throat> but, uh, okay. Um, as long as, as soon as we get, uh, <clears throat> get, uh, confirmation from Chris that he's here and, and can hear us and can get his mic working or whatever, then we'll, uh, we'll get rolling. Let's give uh, let's give Chief um, about five minutes to just oh. go over oh, sure. we can start as many too. different uh, like one one liners of different uh, remedies legal remedies mm -hmm. that and then we'll do that again later on when there's more people here but I think it's a okay. good time to uh, go over just a quick you know five minutes or less yeah. just yeah, let's on do like it. a million different remedies. Sure. I don't know that I can give you a million, but we'll go over a few. <laughs> so um, the easiest thing I think would be the entry of appearance or special visitation of the live life air in the nature of the living, breathing man. If you put that in, that has had the effect of outright halting at least multiple cases. And so no, I'm going to jump in. So you said put that in. You mean read that whenever you get to court or type it in a document what do you mean by put that in yeah uh so sometimes it's called tendering sometimes the court cases like to use the term file but file means that they can effectively round file it and and do what they want with it but if you tender it remember that all of this is banking right so if you're tendering to a bank and and remember what tender is right so the tender or the currency that your value is given to them is something that they can't deny, right? They have to put that into an account. But a, a file, that's a different thing. So it's just vocabulary. But if you give it to them, right, however you want to call giving it to them, it's a no more than a three-line page. And that one thing saying, hey, the special visitation by which this live life heir, this man who is living and breathing, is here. I came to special visit this counsel about this matter and that has had the effect of outright closing down cases that's just the first thing the other thing is if you ask by what nature and cause is established the territorial and subject matter jurisdiction that has had the ability to close down multiple cases so that's another you know feather in your cap right and then there are a variety of other things that are a little bit more work than that, but not very much, right? Like, so you can get a name change and on that name change, you can say, Hey, look, uh, I understand why you all thought that I was your ward. Cause after all, I didn't come and tell you that I attained the age of majority, but Hey man, I'm over 18 now. So I have in fact attained the age of majority and comma, I'm competent to handle all my affairs, my matters, causes, cases, etc. And by the way, I'm removing the minor disability. And in honoring scripture, I'm going to make the first my last, my last my first. And that fulfills the scriptural necessity. And that has had the ability to have people see that and close down a case before you even ask for it to be closed. Merely seeing that you have had that correction has been sufficient for multiple cases to be dropped on its face. So the name change is its own kind of mechanism to close that stuff down. Then you've got, um, so when you have a trademark, service mark, patent, or other legal, um, so if it's a service mark, trademark, copyright, patent, all those have a protection in place. You can get one of them 
for your, in essence, your DNA. If anything that is yours, your image, your likeness, your saliva, your hair, your, your anything that is particular to you, and you have that... Can I say your property, like we think of properties of atoms and properties of items, we say, oh, the properties of oxygen are its weight, it's okay. And then when he says DNA, it's like your property. It's a property of you and it's your properties. Sure, absolutely. So that's one mechanism because ultimately they have to have your consent. And if you have lodged th that property is yours, on the public record somewhere and you have made that claim whether it's patent copyright service mark trademark etc then they owe you no different than if you were to go and try to say um you know hey uh so and so is going to try to say that she's a kardashian i'm pretty sure the kardashians are going to want to get reimbursed for that and when you don't have whether it's a copyright trademark patent service mark etc for the Kardashians, they're gonna be like, uh, "You owe us money," <laughs> but I, I didn't. I didn't think it was harmful. Yeah, we felt harmed. You owe us money. <laughs> so similarly, when you have that established, and a cop goes and tries to use your data to make money, and that's what they're doing. They're trying to make money off of you, and you have that established. You get to say, uh, "Pay up. You did harm me. I want money." <laughs> no different, right? So that's one mechanism. A DBA or an assumed name certificate is another, very similar to that. It says, I assume this name and this certificate verifies that, especially when you get with it something called a certificate of good existence of DBA. In essence, not only do I have the right to assume this name, but I certify, or the Secretary of State more importantly, certifies that this is in fact a good dba in essence you've got the dba itself and the certificate verifying that you had a legit dba a valid dba that says to anyone that would use your name in court whether or not you got your patent copyright trademark service mark or otherwise that has had the ability to say look i assumed that name you didn't where's your dba where's your anc i don't see you having one you, you don't get to use my name without my consent. And so it's a lesser form of protection, admittedly, but it's way cheaper too. You spend 65 bucks at the sex state's office instead of, uh, I think you may spend somewhere between 250 and 450 to get all of your various patent law, uh, copyright, service mark, trademark, etc. So it's a way cheaper form, but it is also fairly effective in, in, that despite it being cheaper, you can shut down court cases. So those are all different little nuances that um, can help you to shut down court cases. There's other things, but the other things are a little bit more lengthy than I think we have in mind here. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, thank Certainly. you. Yeah, yeah I, uh, I just want to say to people that are listening in, and um, if any of this stuff sounds like too much technology for you or it doesn't feel right at the moment um i just recommend that you follow your whatever your internal guidance is or your uh, guidance from above if it's not feeling like the right path then i think that it's kind of like in construction if you don't feel safe you're not safe you know like you're just <coughs> run, using a hammer but like if you don't feel confident doing that um then there might be a reason for not feeling confident doing that and uh, so I just throw that as a caution, like, don't, don't consider it as so scary. You shouldn't hang around these people that talk about technologies or methods like this, but at the same time, uh, follow, follow your own readiness. And if, if you don't under, understand what you're doing and you don't, don't feel ready to do what you're doing, then uh, it's okay to do other things that feel more natural and more in line with what you can handle and what you can do so it was it, i liked his first two methods because they're really simple i mean basically you're going to the court you bring them a piece of paper um and it says some words on it and they look at the words and they're like uh 
okay. <laughs> they might ask you questions like, hey, did you re did you write this? Or uh, they might ask you questions. I've I've heard another method though is, um, and and one that I I think we should employ is, um, I'm I'm kind of going a long way around this, but basically instead of going into court and opening your mouth, instead you go into court and you give papers and you keep your mouth as shut as possible, and that way there's no additional uh, chances for you to get yourself in trouble. So. What that also means is that you could get help to write those documents and submit your paperwork and you would have time to do so if your court was paper to paper through the mail. But if your court is a live court hearing, then you don't have as, as much time to engineer your responses. And uh, so then you, you're relying on your skill set in terms of agility and ability and, you know, uh, what do they say, how to think on your feet, like you're, you're relying on a lot of skills that you might not be good at, but you can rely on the skills of a group of people if you're able to do that on your own time, getting, getting advice, getting help. You might put 10 hours into a document and they will throw that document out without telling you if you get to the court and they start asking you, can you tell us a little bit more about what happened and what they're doing is they're uh, baiting you because once you start producing, providing new information, then everything they had in the past, they don't have to, they don't have to consider it. They say, well, I've got the, I've got the man right here. He's, he's the author. It's like, I go up to a, the author of a, of a film and instead of me watching the film, which is what they prefer, I'm just like, well, I mean, I've got you here. You, you produced it. Just tell me what the film's about. And they're like, well, it's basically they give you 50 words. That's not the film. You didn't watch the film. You don't even know it. But you might in your own sense say, well, I mean, I got the gist of the movie. I mean, I talked to the man who wrote it. So I could do the same thing for Shane here. I could say, hey, Shane, tell me what's in your book. And you could give me your best, you know, 30 minute or 30 second elevator, elevator pitch. Excuse me. But um, for me to consider that now I've read your book because I heard it from your mouth came right from the horse's mouth. He was here. He was available. He told me, I, I even asked him, hey, is there anything else I should know about your case? And he was like, well, no, that's just about it. Boom. The judge doesn't have to consider those 10 hours of your effort. But if you go there to court and you just, you're really strict. This is, tr this is trouble. This is the, the tough part. It's a lot easier if you've got help and you're going back and forth through the mail because you can have time to consider and ask for people's opinions before you write it down and send it. But if you're in there in court, what you want to do is if you've written down everything you need to say, then you're just going to say everything I have to say is written in the documents and I have nothing new. I have no new information to bring to the court. So that's that's all I want to talk to you about court for now. And I think we should revisit it again now that there's a, a few extra people. But um, since this is recorded, then I guess we're good. Um, mm -hmm. But we'll we'll swing back to that after we get to some questions from the group. Sounds good. Sounds good. So it looks like a couple of new folks joined, and I, I see I do see Bastard Chris in there, but uh, I haven't heard him. Uh, I haven't seen him on mute yet. So um, I'll go ahead and just do the uh, um, the quick introdu introduction here to the to the uh, to the thing. Ten minutes in, or however many minutes, however, but that's that's all right. Um, but uh, yeah. Anyway, guys, welcome to the second ever Pasnia Segral Assembly, uh, hosted live here in the Pasnia Committee of Correspondence Telegram, the official chat of the Free Republic. To keep up to date with happenings, just visit t.me forward slash Pasnia chat. For the purposes of transparency and inclusion, uh, this will also be recorded and released on the various Vani podcast feeds. Uh, but obviously, Telegram is totally public, so as always, please do keep relevant security culture uh, and privacy concerns in mind. Uh, regardless, thank you so much for being here today. Uh, this discussion was sparked by the most recent release, uh, TVP number 171, uh, titled Community as an Essence with Rex. Uh, Rex's Pasnia-esque project, vision, philosophies, and ideas uh, sparked further discussion in this chat, uh, which brings us all here today. If you haven't already, make sure to check that episode out. Uh, it's at vonniepodcast.com forward slash 171, or you can find it uh, on Fascist Tube or uh, Odyssey. Uh, but stay here with us live regardless, as I will have Rex provide a brief overview of his vision for those that may have missed it. And uh, in this case, a, ref a refresher might be a damn good idea. Uh, beyond that, the floor will be open, and so the trajectory of this discourse uh, today is largely unknown. Uh, that said, there's at least one topic uh, I want to make sure to address 
uh, maybe even right after Rex's uh, re-summary. So uh, let's do this before we get too deep in. Um, I do see a few new, a few new folks here. So I'm going to introduce Pasnia real quick for those who may be new. Uh, then I want to uh, give everyone a chance to introduce, introduce themselves if they want to. Uh, say a few words. We can chat a bit. And uh, then we'll get uh, over to Rex. So, um, yeah, I guess a brief introduction for Pasnia. Um, the Free Republic of Pasnia, PAZ, um, stands for Permanent Autonomous Zones, which are essentially just pockets of freedom where, where we can you know, be free and have our autonomy. Um, so the idea of Pasnia is a decentralized network of these permanent autonomous zones, uh, whether they're self-sufficient homesteads, um, you know, uh, safe places for people to, uh, you know, city, uh, city park in a van, um, or, you know, things like, uh, you know, maybe a, a self-sustainable greenhouse, uh, you know, a big greenhouse like uh, what Rex is talking about, uh, you know, places where we can, you know, be free and have our autonomy. That's the, that's the idea. And uh, we'll do this, uh, you know, in the way, and I guess in the, um, in the, I guess in the direction of, uh, you know, a decentralized parallel network uh, is the idea. So um, at current, uh, we just started putting together the map and the directory, um, which is only for vetted Pasnians. Uh, this is, uh, you know, a, a, I'm very, very big into, you know, uh, you got to know who you work with. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's one way to, um, you know, building community, knowing who, you're, who, you, want, who you associate with uh, is one way to forego a lot of conflict and coercion in the future. So um, it is a vetted network. We'll, we will have a public map and directory available um, at some point in the future. But obviously, we're starting with the stakeholders um, for, you know, you know, those, uh, you know, those vetted folks. So um, for more information, just visit Pasnia.com. There's a lot of stuff on there. Um, I've, added, I've added a lot um, this year, actually. Um, so um, yeah, Pasnia.com is a place to go for all that. So I guess I'll leave it there for the moment. Um, anyone uh, want to uh, introduce themselves or, uh, you know, say hello? Am I audible? Oh, there we go. There's Chris. Yes. There is Chris. Can you hear us? Okay, so I guess there is. <laughs> I can hear you. <laughs> awesome. Well, welcome, Chris. Right. Great to have you Sorry, here. Awesome. Welcome. Yeah, great to be here. Great to be here. Uh, Rex, great to see you here. Pretty full room. Great to see everybody here. Yep. Certainly, certainly. So, uh, um, Chris, do you want to introduce yourself to the uh, to the folks here? Well, I thought I thought uh, I had a little something else. Oh yeah, um, go for that. Little too, performance. Yeah. I gotta see if I can pull this off. <laughs> this is gonna take some guts here. Hold on. <clears throat> okay. Okay. You everybody hearing me? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, this is illegitimately bastard Chris. Greetings, Pasnia. I'm reporting illiterally from an unfortified compound somewhere on the road in a, in a stationary wagon. President Circumstance has assigned me to a top secret mission where I'm tirelessly working to avoid depression while living as a double agent, deep within friendly enemy territory. All I can tell you is that I can usually be found doing unusual things in my mother's basement. The rest is classified. Before my declassified report, a quick shout out to Bueller and MJ. After a long absence, Mary Juan, sorry, Mary Juan, Mary Juan, Mary Juanita has recently rejoined me on the front lines. Mary has initialized a brief period of increased creativity that will quickly descend into the mass production of excuses. Juanita's arrival also ushers in the return of hyperbolic paranoia and the long-term gain of short-term memory loss. <clears throat> okay, sorry about that. Uh, now for your debriefing from the field. Sean Juan's intelligence reports indicate that as predicted and right on schedule, the cult of claws spent the last week or so venerating ornamental plastic trees and training their reinforcements on how to get anything they want by luring a strangely elusive old fat man into their dwellings late at night while being unseen or unheard and wearing bright garbed clothing. The old fat man declined our interview, but left behind a dithyram warning us to watch out, demanding that everyone is to refrain from shouting, pouting, and crying whenever he's coming to town. Our fact checkers speculate that the old fat man is employed by Status Quo and Co. And note that synchronized sleeping along with milk and cookies are optional, but highly safe and effective. Keynesian economists have unanimously agreed that this peculiar quid pro quo arrangement is in fact a win-win for everyone. Quote, simply shut your mouth and wish for meaningless things. Up this week, praxe praxeologists 
sorry, praxeologists are anticipating the enslaved masses will direct their gullible attention toward a coordinated dissension of large luminescent monotesticles immediately followed by an awkward stint of labial compressions formerly known as kissing. A prompt return to docile civility will signify the conclusion of the annual rituals. And that brings us to our announcements. Uh, the deadline for momentary contemplations of, of temporary self-improvement is quickly approaching. Be sure to make your desultory resolutions at the height of the winter so that any artificial inspiration wears off before spring. Of course, my resolution is to become better at reforming my neighbor so I can continue neglecting self-reformation. Up next, a sap ingros within the Pazian network will be joining us today. Rumor has it will be licking snakes and contriving strategies for milking them. That's all for this special report. Rayo, thanks for the invitation and welcome to the second Second Realm Assembly. <laughs> Amazing, brother. I love it. I love it. Well done. Very good. <laughs> love it. Okay, so um, so Chief, you speak. Oh, um, we can, um, we can, Chief. oh, go ahead, Chris. Sorry. Perhaps we should finish in, in the, the ritual. <laughs> what was that, Chris? Leader benediction. Leader benediction. Noske te ipsum. Age quota geese. I, okay, uh, I do not understand. Acta non verba. Oh, it's a, sorry. It, it's, it was the benediction in Latin. I'll have to oh, work on it. Okay, okay. <laughs> well, it's probably right. I just, I, I, I just wasn't sure what was what was going on. But I, I okay, no, I, I get no, it's Latin. No, I, I, it's, it's, a, it's a fictional thing. Sorry. Okay. So no I, I've been trying to come in, in with a little bit of sense of humor to uh, lighten. Uh, oh no, I, no, I, I appreciate anyways, that. Yeah. No, keep, so, keep going with it. Keep going with it. I was just making sure we were. I was making sure that I was, I wasn't supposed to like translate that. Well, you know, mid going. So. Conversation <laughs> is a hot air balloon at this point. It's very light. <laughs> very nice. Beautiful. Yeah. Well, like one thing when I think about Pasnia, um, and in my current situation, like. It's it's fun to think uh, uh, about what uh, Rayo is called cultural or culture jamming, mm -hmm. and so it's it's fun to to, to mock it, and, and it was easy to write stuff like this. So, oh um, yeah, anyways, yeah, thanks All for listening. Uh, I'm glad to be here. And, <laughs> can um, I can I ask Shane or Rayo? I don't know what I should call you, but can you give like a few of the one liners that I just had? Uh, like I had chief give on the legal side. Um, there's one that I remember you guys say, like becoming invulnerable to state oppression or something. Can you give me the one liners so that for, for chief's benefit so that he kind of can hear Pasnia in, in five minutes or less. Oh, so uh, Pasnia in five minutes or less. <clears throat> um, so, um, yeah, Pasnia, uh, PAZ stands for permanent autonomous zones. Um, Paz is also uh, is also uh, peace in Spanish, so that's what I call it. You know, the life essence of Paznia is peace. Um, so, the Free Republic of Paznia is uh, it's it's uh, a model country. It's a it's a model country project from, by Erwin Erwin Strauss came up with the idea back in the '60s. But uh, basically, it's just dressing for a cooperative or um, a parallel network is a better way to put it. So. Um, yeah, a parallel network of permanent autonomous zones. Um, but the, the main difference between Pasnia, you know, just like, you know, um, Pasnia and what I call the first realm of the Servile Society is that the foundations of Pasnia are peace, you know, volunteer, volu you know volunteerism and, uh, you know, non-coercion. Like these are another way to think about these places are coercion free zones. So they're places where we can be free and exercise our autonomy. Um, and it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's everything, you know, it's, it's all, all aspects of all aspects of humanity. Um, you know, we've got, you know, self-sufficient homesteads, um, and, uh, you know, hopefully our, our own infrastructure, um, you know, to come as well. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, basically rebuilding, rebuilding, uh, rebuilding the first realm, um, on, on the foundation of, uh, upon a foundation of coercion or on a foundation of peace instead of coercion. So that's kind of the, the short elevator pitch, I guess, per se. And what's that, what's that saying that something about, uh, invulnerable to coercion or something. oh yeah oh you're talking about oh you're talking about oh, oh bonnie bonnie yep so um so i guess one uh so the, the so pasnia exercises you know principle of security culture and what i call vanu uh or what i don't call vanu what but it's called vanu 
and it's a uh, basically um, it's the idea is becoming as invulnerable to coercion as humanly possible, both from public coercers, um, governments, and private coercers, uh, private violators of person and property. So um, this is done. Vanu is more of kind of an individual strategy, um, but um, you know, Pazni is obviously more of you know community-based strategy. Um, but yeah, basically, um, an individual pursuit of becoming as invulnerable to coercion as humanly possible uh, is what it comes down to. Thank you. That's what I wanted to hear. Okay. Understood. All right. Who's next? Who's got other questions or whatever? I like it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. All right. Oh. I'm just yeah. going to go ahead and jump in and introduce myself. Um, I'm Blur, and uh, I don't see Chris at the moment, but I was going to say hi to him. Uh, it's been a while since I've spoke with him, and uh, I appreciate his introduction as well. So um, I'm also a ASNIAN here at PASNIA and uh, I'm a member of the Department of Energy and the Department of Health and Wellness for a little culture jamming there. But those are actual projects that we um, are part of. And uh, so one of the things that I've been focusing on recently when it comes to um, energy and uh, power independence and things like that is alternative energy sources. And um, we've actually been using in the Department of Health and Wellness here um, a Browns gas generator, and we've been uh, breathing the Browns gas and drinking it uh, infused in water. And it's a very good antioxidant and antacid, and uh, it's uh, it's basically a good electron donor. Um, but not only that, the gases are combustible, and uh, the electrolysis is efficient enough that when combusted, it can provide a net gain in energy. So we're looking at maybe harnessing that with um, a generator at some point and or finding someone who knows automotive so that we can start to install some of these um, little kits that they've had for a while. Uh, George Wiseman, I don't know if you've heard of him. Um, in the 90s, he started selling uh, it's like automotive I don't uh, I have any conversions sign. and things. Like that. I'm sorry. I couldn't hear what somebody said. Oh. I think it was Chris, but let me. But anyway, let me, um, let me share about that. I I heard somewhere that the um, you was talking about electrolysis of water. The I heard that the acoustic, like you would have like a certain audio frequency, acoustic frequency, at the same time as your electrolysis. I guess it makes it more efficient. So I don't know what the yeah. frequency cavitation, is. Cavitation, I think, I is think what that's it's called. The original. Is that cavitation? Yeah, whatever that. The original, I think, was something about that, where that's how you got yeah, the Yeah, there's game. various ways to the efficiency of the electrolysis of water. And um, uh, a cavitation is one of the processes that can be stimulated through various means. Uh, sometimes if the plates are close enough together, you can have sort of like an arc discharge, which all, which can create um, a cav it can just kind of start the cavitation process. But yes, you can also have like pulse width modulation and sound frequencies. I don't know specifically what those frequencies are, but there's various ways that you can increase the efficiency of the electrolysis of water. So yeah, I'm really excited about all that stuff and want to you know, start some of these projects over the long term. However, we do need someone who's good enough with automotive. You might have to bypass some sensors and change the timing electronically going to work on converting cars but i've been looking at some um some electricity generators that look very simple there was a guy who built one out of two by fours and a few stainless steel plates so i'm gonna look at maybe putting that together hopefully in the next year yeah and and i will add that's i'm i'm, I'm glad you brought that up uh Bueller. but uh um i will add that these you know these fuel saver kits can be installed um we've got uh we're, we're transitioning over you know to off-grid but we've got a propane tank now which is better than you know like for for most of our most of our uh, most of our stuff here so instead of being reliant 100 percent of the time where we only aim to come out like once a year um these kits that can be installed on cars or whatever can also be installed in, like propane tanks too so if you have a propane tank you could get like um you know a lot i don't know what the exact efficiency would be but so you could get you know quite a you could probably get a lot more efficiency out of a uh, propane tank um for you know self-sufficiency self purposes so um yeah, it's pretty. It's pretty incredible stuff. Um, yeah, but Bueller and I have been going down uh, a lot of those, a lot of those uh, rabbit holes, and it's been it's been a lot of fun. And on that note, I guess I should mention. I, I think I've, I've mentioned it in maybe one, or I guess one guest appearance, possibly. But um, Breakthrough Energy Month, um, January, uh, here on the Vani Podcast. So um, 
gonna gonna have Sky Huddleston back on. Uh, probably hopefully go deeper into the Bork engine. Um, now that I have a little little better idea, but I'll hopefully have a little more time to do some more research on that. But um, on that, uh, on his uh, Liberator rocket heater uh, with uh, coming Tesla turbine, um, which is uh, which is amazing. Not the only Tesla turbine that's coming out in the market this next year, um, by the way, apparently. So um, yeah, there's a lot of a lot of really awesome stuff in the works, and um, yeah, a lot of really awesome stuff. And that's not even mentioning, um, I guess, another person I'll be having on is Bernie. Um, who does a lot of he does he, I, I found him a couple of years ago doing monoatomic experiments on YouTube and um, he's uh, he's been doing um, interviews with uh, I guess uh, Nancy and uh, uh, John Hutchinson um, on I guess crystal battery cells and the prospects with those are absolutely um, uh, amazing but I'll kind of leave it there for now because we'll hopefully talk about that next month but uh, Bueller do you have anything else you want to add on on, on any of these on, the, on any of these items Well, I'm glad you brought up uh, Bernie and the Hutchinsons and uh, the crystal battery tech because that's something else I want to add to the list for this next year. Uh, battery technology is uh, should be way better than it is, and um, we're going to see what we can do to uh, mix up some some very good power storage for a really long-term power storage. Like where Some of these batteries could last years without ever needing charged, so I'm really interested in, in that as well. So I've got two things that are also energy related. Um, one is battery, uh, thermal battery, and the, the other one I'm going to talk about first. But this uh, idea that everything is recyclable, um, I didn't really get that idea until recently, maybe a few months back. I heard someone on the radio or something say that the hotter something burns, the more bonds break. And then it made me think back to chemistry and what heat is and atoms when they heat up they shake so the more they shake the more likely they are to break apart and just separate so if you have a long hydrocarbon chain that is uh, some plastic or some something when you burn it at a low rate a low heat you could burn plastic in a uh, like a campfire but the heat isn't very high so the when that plastic turns to a gas it gasifies it dries these are all similar terms here but it basically burns then the exhaust that's coming up out of the fire, you'll see a bunch of black smoke and it's, it's longer chains of hydrocarbons because it's still not broken apart enough. Whereas if you heat it a lot more, you break it down into smaller pieces. And when you get your hydrocarbons broken into very small pieces, I mean, if, if it's hot enough, then you break it completely <coughs> apart. So you got hydrogen and carbon separated. But even before that heat level, you get smaller ones, smaller molecules, because you heated it up higher, you get smaller molecules. Now, if you do that, you can, you can gasify pretty much anything in, in, on the periodic table. Like in college we had, um, we were uh, like plating with aluminum. We would have aluminum in a crucible and it would heat it up so much that it would start putting off aluminum particles into the air because you were turning it to a gas and then we had an electric uh, a plate that we were trying to coat with aluminum. So then we would apply some electricity to attract that. But basically, even aluminum, even any metal can turn into a gas. And what happens if you turn something into a gas and then you condense it, just like you're familiar with water, it can turn into vapor and then it can condense. Well, different materials condense at different pressures and temperatures. So if you had a long line, you could take the landfill of trash and you could grind it up into small pieces and then you could put it into a, um, like a conveyor process and then heat it up. And as you're heating it, then you're taking the gas and you can recondense it at different temperatures and pressures. And then it will drip out into different buckets and you'll get gold in one of those buckets. You'll get silver in another one of those buckets. You'll get water, you'll get usable fuel. So this is where it comes to energy because there's actually quite a bit of usable fuel in trash if we were to want to convert it back to gasoline that we can put in a car. And also it helps to run the process so you don't have to only rely on a solar concentrator and a bunch of mirrors to heat up your trash. You can take some of the outputs that you get and instead of putting it in your car, you can run it through a, um, a jet engine or some, some flame and heat up the trash so that you can heat it up more. So that is a concept that I believe 
was um, not in my mind when I grew up from, you know, the indoctrination was like, hey, this isn't recyclable. But now my current uh, belief is that everything is recyclable because everything can be turned into a gas with enough heat and it can be recondensed. So that's one thing. Everything is recyclable. And then about batteries, the thermal battery, the, the plan for the setup for my greenhouse setup is we're going to have two wells instead of one water well. And we're going to use one of the water wells in the summer. We're going to pull cold water out of that aquifer. And then it's going to be warm. We're going to heat it up even more and inject it into the ground to heat up the ground near a different side of the place. So you're going to have one side and then the other side of the property is going to have the other well. And you're going to cycle it one direction during one season. And then in the other season, you're going to cycle it the other way. So in the winter, you're going to take that warm water and you're going to be able to use it as, you know, warmer water because all of the earth, all of the dirt got heated up during the summer because we pumped in super hot water that we heated up with solar content concentrators or whatever other method we choose. So we're using the earth as a battery and we could dig down and insulate around that battery and fill it with molten salt. But also we might be able to, I haven't tested yet, but we might be able to get away with just simply injecting hot water into the ground on one side and have that ground get warm and then pull the water back out during the winter time. And in the winter time, you're going to do the opposite thing. You're going to pre-cool your water, get it very, very cold before putting it down into the ground. And you virtually have an unlimited size of battery. It's like you can fit tons of joules of energy or therms in that, uh, that, that setup. So you're only relying then on solar power to run the pumps. So that's more. Anyway, next question. <laughs> Those were my comments. No, that's, that's great. That's actually quite interesting about um, recycling materials, uh, especially hydrocarbons, because uh, that reminds me again of the Hutchison's. Uh, they use some sort of ultrasonic um, catalyst when it comes to breaking hydrocarbons down into like water and carbon dioxide and stuff. And they've actually used it on uh, like oil slicks in the Gulf to help clean up the oil spill. But then uh, John Hutchison also uses electromagnetic waves to sort of like recycle um, metallic elements, especially unstable isotopes, into more stable ones so that they're not radioactive. Um, so, that, yeah, there's definitely something there when it comes to um, recycling materials and turning one thing into another uh, and using sound and electromagnetic waves to do that. Another thing that you mentioned also reminded me of electroculture, which is another project we want to try to get into this year. Because um, when you're gardening, you can, I guess, plant these uh, conductive, you know, materials that can act like a conduit for Earth's natural uh, electric and magnetic potentials, and somehow impart that to the plants, and it has quite an effect. So I've heard so we're gonna we're gonna experiment with that this spring too. Yeah, yeah. Just uh, go on YouTube and type in electroculture and. Um... There's this uh, guy who's out in like Sweden or something, and like I guess that was his his college degree was electroculture, and you'll you'll see some of the pictures. He had a sunflower that was just like huge. Like I've never seen a sunflower that big. So apparently it's super effective and it's it's common over there. So we're gonna yeah, experiment with it and see what happens. Um, but uh, but yeah. <clears throat> All right. All right, Chris. What were your questions? Can we go back to, I think everyone that wanted to introduce themselves did. Yeah, if not, raise so. your hand yeah, or so. un unmike yourself. But uh, Chris, I know we had some questions that we were going over in the chat and I thought it would be useful to be here live. If not, I'll, I'll keep, I'll move on. I've, I mean, oh. not leave. I've got more things that I can talk about. I mean, we, we can come back to it or we can jump over to, I mean, there's, there's a little bit, uh, I mean, I can start in a lot of places. I mean, I'm, I'm curious to hear about a lot. Of, here, here to, uh, I'm curious to have you elaborate a lot of things you were talking about on the podcast. Um, so I'm not real sure where you want to resume and try to pick up or segue into. Um, but go for I it. Want you to, I want you to write down some notes and then cut me off and tell me what your notes are um, after I start talking because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk more. <laughs> okay, so, and this is what, this wasn't on the podcast, but we're going to talk about my uh ideal religion so 
Um, hopefully all of you have uh, had a bad experience with religion before, so at least you know where I'm coming from. But um, let's say let's say we made religion um, great again. <laughs> so so anyway, the ideal religion I think needs to be updatable. So um, that's one one aspect of it that it needs to be updatable uh, because the world changes and the needs change. It also needs to be personal, which means it needs to be between you and your God. It doesn't need to involve anyone else. Um, so if you're, if you're using a book for your uh, religion, for me, the ideal religion is a book that you and God wrote together for you. That's the ideal uh, sacred text for you. Um, and the other thing that I find is that things are more useful when they are at least to to me as an engineer, and let's say I'm the god with respect to what I create. So if I'm the engineer, what I find is the most useful materials are materials that are consistent and um, I know what they are and I know what their properties are. So I might I might like to use oxygen and iron and things because every single oxygen seems to act the same way. It weighs the same amount, it does the same thing. And this is something that as humans, sometimes we act, I would say, unpredictably uh, and not consistently in terms of how we spend our time and, and how we, you know, marry our values in a sense, how we connect with and, and uh, infuse values into our life and into our schedule. So... Since the engineer finds it useful if you're consistent, I think that for us to be most useful to the God, then us being consistent is important. And so being able to set up your, taking your values that you communicate with your God to find out what they are, or you meditate or you observe from outside of yourself, looking at yourself, looking at your life and saying, hey, um, what does this person value? Then once you know what your values are and you've chosen what those are and between you and your God, you're, you're happy with those, you, they feel right. Then you take those values and put them into your schedule and you be rather rigid sometimes about, uh, as in strict with yourself about doing the things and putting your effort, energy, and time into those values proportionate to how much you value them. So once you've done that, you become a very consistent person. You're basically always doing the same thing at a certain time every week or whatever. Let's say you have a weekly schedule, then almost every week at 7 p.m. on Thursday, you're doing this certain thing. That helps you and it helps everyone else coordinate with you. So that way, um, you're not doing it alone because let's say you like to play tennis and you like to play at a certain time every week. It's going to be easier for you to find tennis mates if or people to play tennis with if you're consistent because then all they have to do is be consistent as well and choose the same time as you. And now you guys get to play tennis every week at the same time every week, all the time. So I've been in my past, and current actually um, rather inconsistent in terms of when I do what I do and deciding what my schedule is. So, and all, I mean, what I value from sort of changes too, but what I value the most, I do all the time, which is uh, I value like solving problems and thinking things through. And I basically spend all my time doing that. It's all in my head, but um, it is what it is. So, in that sense, I'm consistent, but it's not a consistent doing. It's more like not with other people, not an activity with other people. But yeah, write write your that's that's the ideal religion. So maybe that relates to anybody as well. But just like identity, this is related to those those atoms: oxygen, silver, gold. Um, they don't have to run around the universe and show an ID card from the government that that allows them to be who they are or or says yeah you know he can be an oxygen the thing is that oxygen has properties 
and characteristics that it is consistent about and it does cons it, it acts the same all the time and so it self identifies it doesn't even need an id card to say hey this is who i am and uh humans do that too but they but we're all under this um modern day spell or modern day um I don't know. I don't want to use that word. I want to just say like concept. The concept that we have today is that you need an ID card. You need a passport. You need a driver's license. You need this. Back in the day before any of that stuff existed, all you had was your face and your face doesn't actually change very often. It's relatively consistent from minute to minute for sure. Um, but from year to year, you pretty much always look the same. And uh, since communities were smaller, I, I'm inventing a past. I don't even know what the real past is, but you know, Tartaria wise, but uh, inventing a past where you lived in a small community with like less than 200 people. And when people saw your face, they knew who you were. You didn't even have to have a name back then. They knew who you were, they could recognize you. And uh, you didn't walk around with, you know, a, a hoodie on covering your face. Cause that, that would be, you'd be anonymous at that point, And that wouldn't make everyone comfortable. So it's weird these days where the AI government wants to have you be open Komodo. I think that's the, the word. Um, and they want to be able to see everything in your life. And then they want you to have privacy from each other. And then they kind of don't even want you to have a community. That's, uh, that's the world of the, the AI governments that are trying to take over our, our present realm. But in reality, we never had full privacy in the past. In the past, you would walk into the grocery store and they knew who you were because <laughs> they'd seen you a million times or many times, not a million, but many times. Now, if you live in a city, you'll see people that don't know you and you won't know them. Very interesting. It's a different kind of privacy versus not privacy. And uh, yeah, weird concepts, good concepts, I think. What's next, um, Chris? What were we talking about that you wanted to hear more about? Oh, I mean, uh, well, thanks for sharing that. Um, quite, quite a few things there. Uh, but yeah, just to, to address your question first off, um, yeah, I mean, the first thing that comes to mind is uh, the DAO, how are you talking about that? But I think what we were talking about in the <coughs> chat was also um, kind of about uh, uh, well, I guess I guess I'd probably say it's it's a terminology kind of thing. Um, I guess you mentioned here the ideal religion, um, unless I, I might have missed something, but uh, you know, and, and you probably have somewhere. But we, you know, we need to talk about what you mean by religion, and what do we really mean when we're talking about this? Um, like, you could, like, like, how do we make that what you're saying more concrete when it comes when we're talking about something you know so uh, that's also ab abstract? Um, yeah, let's say from. From my upbringing, I have not necessarily written a definition or read one in a dictionary, but from my upbringing, religion was uh, people that would, uh, they would kind of all form a group, basically. They would go to church, they would uh, believe certain things that they read in books, and it was, um, in terms of the effect it has on society, is sometimes people will be holding on to a belief that is obsolete for a long time because they have a strong connection with their uh, cult maybe, or their, their group. And their group has some words written down that are not easily editable because the words are like the Bible or something. And to me, the, the problem has, I've seen that as a problem where society is now different and then people are holding on to words that they don't even actually understand because they weren't around when they were written and they can't talk to the person that wrote them. So they're holding on to words that they understand as best they can. And those words might not even be valid in the current world that they're living in. So that holds them back. So some, it's almost like the churches would be the last ones to accept someone being gay the religions were like pulling backward, I would say, on certain types of progress. 
even though if you were to look at the religion from a different point of view, you'd say, well, aren't you not supposed to be judging anybody or whatever? So I think there's a lot of things in society where a strong religion almost acts like an inductor in an electronic system where it, it keeps, it keeps, it keeps rapid change from happening. So if you're looking at a, a stock market, you got uh, volatility, it removes the volatility from the society, not completely, but it, it, it tempers it so that there's not as much volatility in terms of where our brains go and where, what we accept as normal. So religions, what they accept as normal is more consistent and it's less m mobile than what society accepts as normal because society accepts as normal whatever they see on tv and that's talking <laughs> they're just messing with our brains they're scrambling it <sighs> but uh i guess listening to what i'm saying you probably don't see whether i believe one is better than the other um i do think being consistent is important and it's good but i don't think you should be consistent at something that you that's not right for you and i think everyone's different so that's where it comes into a personal religion is better, you know, replace religion, get rid of religion or whatever, because ultimately you shouldn't necessarily be, uh, I mean, I, I don't even like the word should, right? To each his own, really. So religion, I don't know. It's my language isn't that uh, tied down. In fact, my worldview isn't tied down either. I have multiple worldviews. I'll look at the world one way and I'll look at it another way and I'll look at another way. And, and uh, ultimately I don't have a right or wrong um, attachment myself, not very strong right or wrong attachment to anything. It's, it's really, for me, you, if you attach too much emotion to analysis, then you sometimes miss things because you're too attached you're too biased so uh, sometimes it helps to not be too attached to what you're studying and analyzing and just keep your eyes open and try to make sense of it and once you make some sense of it don't think yours is the only right answer because hopefully like me I have multiple right answers all different and that's fine with me I like it I like it because it's it, it's a bigger toolkit to deal with uh, or to experience life through, you know, it's more than one lens to experience life through. That's a good thing. It gives you options. Um, what else did you say? Oh, you said the Tao. So the Tao, there's a crypto side and then there's, that's, that's the one that's most mechanical in terms of there's just mechanics. We, we could write the algorithms today because we know what they would be. Um, so in, in that terms, that's the asset DAO. And the asset DAO is an asset management platform, much like Airbnb, um, because Airbnb manages assets. They don't necessarily own all the assets, but they um, determine who's going to stay in which house or room. Um, which Airbnb, they determine who's going to stay there, what the price will be um, with the help of the hosts, right? They have a bunch of employees that work for Airbnb. I would be eliminating those because I'd rather write, uh, write a program that is decentralized and autonomous and it runs on its own. So DAO, Distributed Autonomous Organization. Uh, so I would be eliminating those employees, like the CEO of Airbnb, gone. The, uh, the employees, gone, hopefully. But the hosts, I would also like them to be gone because for me, a, a good Airbnb, well, a good system is user run because I don't like the idea of relying on outside um, resources in order to run. So that means the members own the system and the members run the system for the benefit of the members. So what that means is instead of hiring a CEO, we just uh, make a virtual CEO and we all take uh, put our input into what that CEO is going to do and say, and hopefully 
it follows. So it could be an AI, it could be a chat bot, or it could just be, you know, blockchain with data. So how else does it work? So that's the, that's the, that, that sort of explains why I think it shouldn't have workers necessarily. So if I could get an Airbnb, the, the thing is, I, I think of this, I think of this future as one where like, I've got just 10 of my buddies and we're all trillionaires, but we got to figure our shit out because no one's coming to help do our dishes or change our diapers, you know, like got to figure your shit out. So although we all have unlimited or virtually unlimited abilities, we don't necessarily want to do for each other what in the outside world people would do for money. We're no longer motivated by money. And in, in my friend group, we aren't going to want necessarily slavery either, or even, uh, you know, for me, it's just play. It's, it's almost slavery for me to ask someone to do something for money. Like they're going to do it for money. And I have an unlimited amount of money. To me, that's akin to slavery because you're asking them to do something for you and you're going to give them something that's unlimited. It's, it's a unconscionable agreement for me to take 1000 hours of someone else's time in trade for two minutes of my time, because that's my, I believe that's how much I'm worth, you know, the, I, I don't, I don't believe that, that, I don't buy it. I don't buy that, uh, that, that belief system. I know that it works. I know it works. I've seen it. I've seen someone does uses the secret or whatever method they want to build up their own self-worth to the point where they believe that they're worth $500 an hour fine. Nothing wrong with that. But they build up their self-worth so much that they're worth $500 an hour. And the world responds and says, yes, because that's how, that's how the world is. If you want it, you believe it, you get it. That's how it goes. I just look at those people and I'm like, I, I don't want to be responsible for, I feel like that you're bringing a lot of negative karma into your life by doing that. If you're going to say, Hey, everyone else makes $10 an hour. I make $500 an hour. And I want that. Uh, unless those other people are somehow benefiting by being deceived into thinking they're worth $10 an hour. And you've deceived yourself into believing you're worth $500 an hour. I don't, I don't get it. I'm going on a tangent, but let's go back to if all we have is ourselves to run a system and we want a good system, we got to figure out how to build it. So a system called Airbnb that is member run, then you don't have a host that's going to come and clean your sheets. You got to figure that out, right? Let's say I want to be traveling, but I want to own an Airbnb. So what I want is I want to have my Airbnb where there's two sets of sheets. And when you get there, there's no clean sheets on your bed. You're going to have to go get them out of the washer or out of the dryer. You go get your sheets out of the dryer and put them on your bed. Well, great. Now I've eliminated the need for, uh, for a host to come and clean the place. Well, how do you also keep people from needing to clean the place? So if you have like a deposit or a cleaning fee, let's say, let's say it costs $20 a night to stay in my Airbnb because I made an Airbnb that's member run. It costs $20 a night to stay, but it costs $500 to clean the thing. So the other benefit is I let you clean it yourself. So it's a cleaning deposit. And uh, when you get there, you look around and if it's clean, you take, can, you take um, responsibility for its cleanliness. You say, okay, it's this clean. I'm happy with it. I'm going to sign off that the previous guest gets their $500 back. Now my $500 is on the hook. Okay, great. By the time you leave, your $500 is on the hook until the next guy comes and takes ownership and says, yeah, it's clean. So I'll take responsibility for making sure it's clean after I'm gone. So that's the theory of how, sorry, I feel like my phone needs this. So that's the theory of how you would build an Airbnb that doesn't require the host to exist because the host can be gone for five months 
and all of the users would wipe their own ass. They would clean their own sheets. They would like, what does the host need to do? So um, the system that I build in terms of the DAO is uh, asset DAO is a way for people to let other people share the utility of the asset, which the asset could be an Airbnb style asset. It could be a jet. It could be uh, a car. It could be anything that is useful that you would rent it if it was convenient and rentable. And especially if it was super cheap to rent, you just had to give a huge deposit, but Hey, you're going to get your deposit back because you're not an abuser of the system. If you are an abuser of the system, then you filter yourself out because it becomes expensive for abusers to use the system. But for people that are, there's one, I just remembered how this went, how I came up with this. You got a, you got an uncle that's a trillionaire. He's got a really nice cabin. Okay. You call your uncle and ask if you can use the cabin. And he's like, sure. But the question is, who's going to clean the cabin and who's going to pay for the cleaning of the cabin when some really rich dude allows his family to stay there. At that point, the family just needs to take care of it. They need to either, if they don't want to clean it, they better bring someone with that will clean it, that wants to clean it. Um, or the rich dude has to tell you no and you never get to use his cabin. And it sits empty all the time because no one can use it because everyone, someone ruined it for everyone. Someone went there, caused damage or made it messy and didn't clean it. And then the rich dude comes back and he's like, what the hell? I got to spend five minutes of my day that I didn't plan on spending cleaning up after my people that are, I supposedly like, but like wish they would appreciate what I allowed them to have. So um, that still not, doesn't explain all of the Dow, but this is like the, the theory behind how we're going to build it, right? What gets built is, after you look at the theory of why it was built, um, then you see what's built. And then hopefully you understand the, and appreciate, you know, it's, it's easier for me to understand what something does if I know why it does it. So, so the asset DAO does that. It eliminates all of the needs for anyone other than the members themselves, the users themselves to have ownership in the system, to operate the system, and to benefit from the system because it's kind of a one layer system. There are no slaves that are gonna clean up after you. There are no owners that are gonna take a cut and make it so you have to pay full price for something, retail price, whatever that is. None of that exists. All that exists is a massive deposit and super cheap rent. So you're paying like $3 a night to stay somewhere because the owner doesn't care. The owner's cool like you. He's like, I don't care. As long as it looks good when it's time for me to use it, I don't care. Three bucks a night. Go for it. Just make sure you give me a $10,000 deposit. And you're like, okay, done. You get your deposit back and everything's cool. So asset now manages any type of asset. Oh, someone's talking almost. Uh, I was going to, uh, um, cause I, I was, I was going to have you provide a little bit and you, you kind of, um, you kind of have a little bit so far, but, um, when in the, uh, in the, uh, TVP episode that you were on, you, you kind of talked about how the DAO would look more in the, in the area of, uh, or I guess like, uh, on some of the, in some of the land that you have and um, how that would actually look and, and, and kind of, uh, kind of work in your network. So could you talk a little bit about that? Yes. Okay. Thanks for cutting me off. Cause, uh, I, I sometimes <coughs> need guidance here. So. I have land in Utah right now. I have two pieces. One is 40 acres, one is five acres. The first one, the five acres is seven minutes from Beaver, Utah and grocery stores, other towns nearby. Walmart's about 50 minutes from there because it's, it's in Cedar City. But um, we're seven minutes from Beaver, Utah. We've got, it's, they're decently sized towns. So it's nice that we're close. We're right off of a main highway, not the, not I-215, but like uh, one of the main highways that goes to the other cities. And those five acres will be 24 units. Each unit is about 3000 square feet in size. The units are going to be, I think I have it for, yeah, 
four on each side of the road. So it looks like if you imagine an E echo, if you imagine an E, it's like an E with like five extra or two extra little lines out because it's a bunch of cul-de-sac lanes. So um, each cul-de-sac lane will have about eight houses, or eight units on each side. And so there's gonna be one main road um, off of the main highway, you're going to be able to turn in. And then once you're in the little land, the five acres, then there's going to be three different cul-de-sacs and each cul-de-sac is going to have eight units on it. And uh, the units are going to be like, you could call it underground um, because the, the road level is going to be at the same level as your unit, but the walls are backfilled with dirt. Um, between each unit, there's about a 12 foot thick uh, wall of dirt and behind the units, there's a wall of dirt. And then the, um, the height of each unit is enough that an RV goes in it just fine. And it's like a greenhouse. It's like a halfway underground greenhouse. So you've got the thermal um, temper, temperament, I guess, tempering the temperature. So climate control and also the, since it's underground, it makes it just easier to control the climate, but we'll be controlling the climate with the, with the sun and with the water from an aquifer. And we're just gonna cycle it. So we don't have to get rid of the water. We just pull it up and push it back down into the ground. Um, and so the cost of cooling the place will be much cheaper, which cheaper in this sense means you don't need as many solar panels because you can still cool stuff down with solar panels, but if all you need to run is pumps, then that's safe. Like that's, that's cheaper because you get a lot of energy just from the water source, you know, um, the underground temperature. So there's going to be 24 units there. Each unit, instead of me selling the units, I say me, instead of the Dow selling the units to individual people that would own a specific unit. Instead, it's more like a timeshare in a hotel or a timeshare in an in Airbnb. So with your timeshare, you would have credits that you would um, use towards stays in these locations. There will be short term rental uh, units. And these units might these sites might be used for events as event space. But there's also going to be long-term rental where you are renting indefinitely. Um, so you would be renting there for a year or two before the algorithm says, hey, you know, we've got better friends for you somewhere else, you know? And the, the amount of time is variable. It's up to you how long you stay. But there's going to be an algorithm that is going to give you a discount, a 75% discount on how many credits you have to spend to stay there which creates the ability for you to bid on or stay in nicer areas than you would be able to with the number of timeshare um, credits or timeshare stake that you have. So if you were to buy in, let's say you work six months, then you get six months work worth of stake, which is the timeshare. That should be enough, I believe, that you would always have a place to stay for the rest of your life in this system. The way this system works is it, in, I say incentivizes, it makes it so that someone that wants to have more value in the system, they basically have to build more units. So we're increasing the supply so much so that hopefully the supply is so much that it's just cheap, like super cheap to stay. Uh, somewhere. So you'll always have a place to stay and it'll be cheap. The cost is going to be in points, which are timeshare, uh, like credits toward using the timeshare. It doesn't diminish the amount of stake, which is the timeshare itself that you own. It just, your timeshare produces 10, 1% uh, per month. So let's say you have $30,000 worth of timeshare or six months worth of work, which is amounts to the same number of stake should. It should amount to about the same number of stake. And that amount of stake is enough that you should always have a place to stay. 
So you're getting from that $30,000, let's say it's, let's just call that, let me see what it is. Let's call that 100,000 stake. So let's say it was 100,000 stake and you're gonna get 1% per month. So you're gonna get an additional, or you're gonna get 1,000 points. So your stake's gonna stay at 100,000, but the points, which is like the credits to use on the system is gonna be 1,000 points a month because you own you worked for or you purchased someone else's labor because these are tied to work. They're not tied to money. They're tied to you put in your effort. Someone put in their time and effort to build a, a unit. So a greenhouse or a place, an asset. One minute equals one stake. So that's why we're at like 100,000 stakes, let's say. 100,000 minutes, that's way too much. Cause you work like 2000 hours a year. So that's 60 times two. Uh, it's, okay. It's, it's within, it's within reason. So, so a hundred thousand stake, you get 1000 points a month and you take those points and then you're bidding against other people, but it's not like an active bid process where you have to like always be bidding. It's uh, you're going to put, Hey, I like this place where I'm going to stay. This is the maximum I'm willing to pay to stay here. And then you're gonna be on a list. Let's say there's 24 units in this place um, and you're the third one down in terms of who would have to leave first. The guy at the bottom that's like, you know, I'm only willing to pay 200 points a month and you're, you're happy to pay your full thousand. And since it's a good place for you, you're bidding at 4,000 because you're putting all your, all your credits, you're saying you're willing to pay that. You, everyone pays the same amount to stay in the same, you know, community pretty much. So if you're willing to pay 4,000, but the lowest guy on the list is only willing to pay 200, then everyone just pays 200 each unit, 200, 200, 200. So you're going to put in i I'm willing to pay this much into the algorithm, into the blockchain. And then that blockchain is going to say, okay, cool you're at this spot. And then you're gonna get a notification if everyone else wants it bad enough that you're at the bottom of the list. It's gonna be like, um, you might have to leave or pay more. It's gonna be the, the notification you get from the blockchain. And then it's gonna be up to you to either increase your bid to stay there and just say, hey, you know, okay, I'm willing to pay. You know, I'm willing to stay. I'd like to stay. Um, since you're an incumbent, you're living there now, you have some um, additional protection so that like, so that you don't you don't get kicked out without your knowledge, right? You you'll know that you weren't willing to pay what everyone else was willing to pay to live right next to the ski resort or up at the beautiful mountain location that we have, right? So my vision is that when these are off grid, then the members that participate in the system will Together, we will get to a point where we don't need a city anymore for us to be happy and have all the things that we need. So if we no longer need a city, then we can buy beautiful land for a good price that's ours from the city. It becomes a lot cheaper to buy land at that when you don't need to be three hours from the city. Or, I mean, three hours from the city is the land's cheaper out there. That's what I'm saying. And especially when all you need is small amount of a big piece of property and we build it and you get to live in a nice place. Did that answer? I know I'm, I know I'm everywhere right now. Um, I think that's pretty, yeah, pretty good. Uh, yeah, pretty good overview. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Um, I guess, um, let me see. I did just have a thought cause, uh, cause chief is here and, um, I, I was just curious, um, to talk a little bit about this too, just as, um, pot potentialities. But, um, um, so speaking of land, um, I think you said you were looking at like more of a, I guess a tribal sort of uh, delegate, uh, delegation. I don't know what the type what the proper wording would be. Um, I guess, is there a uh, chief, do you put, do you know of any way possibly to, to, if I'd actually get a lodial, a lodial title on land? Um, is that actually possible? I'm going to talk. I'm going to tell so, one idea first. So, um, cause already chief and I already talked about this. So mm -hmm. one idea that I have is to take the land and let's say it's 40 acres of land. Then you take the outside ring one inch and we put that under a certain jurisdiction so that if someone crosses into our land without permission, then they had to have broken, uh, they had to have crossed a certain jurisdiction that was 
maybe we have some people that are experts at equity law and we say, okay, well that, that outer inch is for you guys. The next inch in is for someone else. So we have multiple layers of protection in terms of jurisdictions and people that we have that are experts at different types of law. So that's something that um, I was going to add into our future potential. And I'm gonna turn it over to Chief now. So you asked about allodial title. So allodial title is a, a kind of a parlance about how one uses a land patent. A letters patent and a land patent are nothing more than, than patents, right? So they would be run through the United States Property and Fiscal Office or USPFO. So what you're ideally looking, looking to do if, if you're going to go that route is to A, have something in the way of a receipt so that you have a purchase. With that purchase, right, you then take that what is ultimately a chain of title to verify that it has no encumbrances. Now, most co most title companies worth their salt will do this already. And every title company has an obligation, a duty, right, to go all the way back to the original. Now, most of them fail to do this. It is in the industry for some reason tolerated that, oh, well, so what if they didn't go all the way back? They went back to the last time someone else had it. And that's not really what you're looking for. I say that because what you're trying to do, if you're gonna go the whole land patent or letters patent or allodial title, as you're calling it, then you need to go back to when the first instance of the US owning that land became acknowledged as the US, right? So basically, when did that corporate organism begin to own that land? And ideally, you want it to go back at least that far. And so if you get that data and you say, okay, well, I can show back to, I don't know, John Henry Adams on, I don't know, something in around the 1600s, that's fine. You don't need to go back further than that because that's the beginning of the corporate organism having some level of control as a colony, et cetera. That will be sufficient toward establishing that you have the title for that plot of land. Now they can call it a plot, they can call it a plat, they can call it a, a parcel ID. It, it's less relevant how they label it and more relevant that there is a chain of custody for that title. When you get that, you then need to prove it up. And proving it up, in essence, rules out that no one else can possibly have a claim on that title. And in order to clear up or uncloud that title, you have to do a very exhaustive search. And now the title companies are supposed to do this for you. They promise in writing, all the title companies do. So when you buy a, a real estate, you're basically told, hey, we already did the title search. We, we made sure that there's no encumbrances on it, right? So we're frequently misled to believe that this lack of encumbrance has already been verified, but they don't go back to the original title. And that's what they're supposed to do. That's what they promise and tell you in writing that they do. So to get it, you have to kind of force their hand and say, okay, so if you did your work in verifying that there's no encumbrances, then you're putting in writing that this is enough that I can get a land patent on this, on this title, correct? Well, now that they've already put in writing that they were going to help you to clear the title, now you're kind of telling them, by the way, I know your job and I know what you were supposed to do and you didn't do it. And so I'm asking you to really and truly do your job and help me to clear this title. And when you get that cleared title, then you send that back. And when I say send that back, I don't mean to the, the title company. You send it to the United States as a corporate entity, or in this case, the United States of America, since the US has effectively been foreclosed. You send it to the United States of America and you say, look, I seek to do, whether you do this through USPFO or you do this through uh, the Department of Agriculture, you get one of those two entities to acknowledge 
okay, this title is clear. When you do, then you get a whole different type of title. And that is where your allodial title comes in. So far, does this all track? Uh, yeah, it does actually. Yeah. Um, right, and I'm so, glad, I'm glad you use the, the word, uh, land patents too, because that's the new, um, I came, I, I guess I, I started looking into this, this year, um, Alpha Vedic, a podcast I listened to talk to a guy named Ron Gibson, who does a lot of land patents for, I guess, the mining industry and such. Apparently this is, you know, this is, or I guess in the oil industry too, it's, it's very common. Um, so I, I'm glad you, you mentioned land patents sure. specifically. So yeah, um, yeah, go ahead. That's yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll track in. So. Ron Gibson is, is very good at this on the commercial side. It's as applicable in the non-commercial side. And ultimately, if you're going to do, let's just say Ron Gibson's, if you look at his PDF, right? And then you say, okay, I'm going to take this information and in essence, use it as a kind of template to tell someone who is a representative of either the Department of Agriculture or of the USPFO, hey, I, I would like this lien, this ag lien lifted because of this patent that says that I have clear title. Well, now you have a lawful means and, and the standing in law to say, hey, I'm the only one that does have the standing to rebut this ag lien. And they have that ag lien on every single one of us. And I mean us, not just the lands we live on, us. They have an ag lien on us, you and I, the physical arm and legs people. And you need to lift that. So you're gonna challenge that alleged claim that they have the ability to own your body through an agricultural lien. Effectively, they're basically saying that you're still on a plantation and that they own that plantation. So they're using your body as a are kind of literal legal slavehold. So getting the land patent and the letters patent for that particular area is a way of saying both simultaneously, I'm rebutting your presumption that you own me and I'm rebutting the presumption that anyone owns any part of me and comma, that anyone owns any part of the land that I've just purchased. And if you do that within three days and they balk at all, then you can rescind the whole thing. And if you've already registered or excuse me, recorded the receipt on the county, just the receipt of your purchase on the county, that shows indefeasible title in essence they don't have the ability to to challenge the fact that you bought it outright so if you record that before any of these so-called mortgages or anything else then you're you're showing cause hey guys my receipt says that nobody else owns this land right if you do that before any of these other mortgage or companies begins then now all of a sudden because you record that receipt, that purchase from the bill of sale. Now, all these people who are going to try to flip who's the creditor, who's the debtor and who, how the mortgage scam works. They're, they're in essence, and, and I don't know how savvy your, your listeners are on the particulars of the exact wording. So I'll break it down if need be, but ultimately they try to flip the positions of who's the creditor, who's the debtor. And by the way, they're going to say that the debtor is now able to be the servicer to the creditor now acting as the debtor so that ultimately although they have absolutely no legal ground to stand on not even legal never mind lawful they don't have any legal ground to stand on but they're going to try to present themselves as the servicer right because that way they can still at least demand payment as the servicer but now who is it that is giving money to whom the creditor, i.e. the guy that signed the, the ink, meaning you, that is where the value was originated. So they try to flip it so that they can get more value out of you. But when you take that receipt, that bill of sale, and you go record it, you're saying it doesn't matter what fancy hooligans that they try to, you know, shenanigans that they try to pull on you. I just showed you I owned this. And that receipt proves it. It's not just evidence, it's proof. 
and and that stands up in any court of law. That receipt stands up in any court of law. So if you file that before your first payment, then they have no ground to stand on. At that point, you can then question the mortgage and then say, okay, where is it that such and such mortgage believes that I, who created this value, owe them any money? And at that point, if they do believe that your prom note was not already accepted in lieu in place of that note, right? Then what was it exchanged for? They're never going to tell you that because they already hypothecated it on the backside. And they're never going to tell you that they sold that note already. That's why they never show you the original after that point because they sold it. And they sold it for a lot more money than you gave it to them literally to the tune of nine times. So let's say you bought a million dollar mansion. They made 9 million off of your million. And they don't even ever tell you this. So you getting the land patent is a way to say that mortgage company and anybody else, not just the mortgage company and anybody else has absolutely no standing, no situs, no status to speak to me about this point, about this claim ever again. And that is why it has that much power. And I highly recommend what Ryo was referencing earlier. Read the, the Ron Gibson's PDF. And he goes through a fair amount on that process. That's all I'll yield. Amazing. Yeah, thank you for that. That's uh and I'm I'm glad uh yeah, I'm glad Ron Gibson's a solid uh solid guy on that. It's kind of that's that was my impression too. So um and for for Pazny, the reason this is relevant is there's um, obviously we got our pockets of freedoms and we can practice security culture and all, but at some point it may be, it may be necessary to start looking at, you know, the relationship with the first realm. Um, and that, that brings up something else that was brought up in chat, um, about like unincorporated townships and such. Um, but, uh, um, there may be times when, um, and, and some Pasnia, some nodes might need to consider, um, yeah, going for, uh, the land patent, um, or whatever. Um, at some point. So I think that's, yeah, that's uh, incredible information. I appreciate that, Chief. Uh, thanks a lot for that. Um, so I guess uh, Rex or Chris, did we have uh, anything else we wanted to to discuss? I think there were probably plenty of things. Yeah, we could go back over um, protection unions. Um, and you mentioned the unincorporated uh, things. So when I wanted to create an organization, if I if I consider I wanted to create a company, then it would seem that my company needs to be registered or I need to get a tax identification number in order to even get a bank account on that company, which most companies have bank accounts. Most companies have tax identification numbers. Most companies have business licenses. Most companies are registered at the state, secretary of state. Um, for the nearest uh, presumed jurisdiction. So when I thought of what I wanted to build, which is something that is invulnerable to um, coercion, I thought, if I'm going to build an organization, but, if, but then I have to be subject to asking some other human or fictional organization for permission for me to build my organization, I, it just, I think that when you're asking permission from someone, it's almost as if you're giving them the authority or power to tell you no. Like if, if I, if I have a right to do something, why would I need to go ask someone else if I can do it? And if I go ask them, is that not admitting that they have some ability to grant me the right? To do it well that's why permit and permission sound the same to me um i looked up those words and i'm like yeah i mean permit permission i don't need to ask for a permit or permission well the thing is in many locations the, the business that i want to run requires permits and in, in many places in many people's minds and many people's world views they need to get a permit to build something but i don't want to build something myself, I don't want to put my time and effort into it if it's going to be simple to destroy. So build my house of cards. Well, I'm not going to do that if there's a two-year-old running around. 
And I think that the bureaucrats that are running uh, the city or the county, I, I think I'd like to be above them in terms of my, uh, the security of what I build. So they also have this thing where if you're not paying property taxes, they like to take your property, which is also a problem for me because I want to build an organization and a platform that does not require money to participate in. No money, no money at all, zero money. So are they going to come over and pick their own tomatoes or are they going to ask us to pay property taxes in dollars? And then if I don't pay property taxes in dollars, not me, but also I want to build an organization where there's an organization where there is no representative for the organization that could be jailed or threatened because that is vulnerability to me. So for the organization, so having someone that could be coerced by threat of death or ruining their life or, you know, killing their family or what, I mean, I don't need to go crazy, but it, it is like, if the person doesn't exist, Elon Musk said the best part is no part for his car, right? Because no part doesn't cost anything and it doesn't break down. It's the absence of a part. As long as you just design that away, so you don't even need that part anymore. That's the best part. That's the ideal scenario is it costs nothing. It weighs nothing. It, you don't need to get it, source any materials for it. So for me, that's the same for the CEO or for any position in this company that I'd like to build, this business side I'd like to build. And I don't want to be asking for permission either because I would rather be between me and nature. You know, if nature denies me, so be it. What can I do about that? I could try to fight nature. Okay. But I'd rather fight nature. I'd rather fight, you know, the dirt than fighting some other person that thinks that they have a right to tell me what to do. Anyway, I'm going off track. Where was I at? Protection union, maybe. Taxes. So I didn't want ta property taxes because I didn't want things to just get, to just deteriorate because, um, or be shut down by someone that says they have jurisdiction because the property taxes kind of goes along with, even if property taxes were necessary and like had to be done, it's very close to that permitting thing where people can just walk up and say, Oh, that's, you know, that's not, that's not right. You can't do that. And what I'm trying to build needs to be scalable to earth wide, the whole earth. I need to figure out solutions that allow me to go in every country of the world and start and build and have these places where people can move from one place to the next. It also helps those people because if you're in one place, you're not as secure as if you have multiple locations where you can be. So if not that I'm saying we need to run from the law, but the way that the, the way that the AI wants to control everyone, it's kind of, you might have to run from the law at some point just to survive, just to live your life the way you want. You might be cho choosing live as a slave of an AI, die, valid fucking option, valid fucking able to live in, um, if I'm able to move from one place to the next, then I'm not as subject to uh, being found by the police and getting, getting in trouble or anything like that. Um, so in terms of security and protection and building something that's not going to just get torn down and thrown down by by uh, by a random bureaucrat in the future. I just didn't want to put my efforts into that. It's like it's like the foundation of your house. You know, you want to find a foundation that's worth worth its salt before you start building. So that's what I came up with um, in terms of requirements. And then I started seeking a little bit into those requirements, 
about what we could do to make that happen. And I came across land patents and status correction and using a church. If it's church owned property, if it's a cemetery, there's different things where the where it's customary throughout the entire earth. Like churches customarily throughout every jurisdiction I've ever heard of in on earth, they don't normally pay taxes. So that's one good way to do it is make all of this property church property and let people live in the church property and let them worship by however they, you know, whatever their religion tells them to do, to worship. So maybe that means growing a garden and eating the food in the garden and hanging out with your friends. <laughs> and if that's what it means, then good. You're a good church goer. <laughs> so yeah, those, those are just different ways that I've found uh, thought through on my own. And then the, the other way was uh, going back to the really basics. Um, Elon Musk says this as well. He says, uh, first principle thinking, and it, he relates it to uh, trying to design a product. So he'll say, all right, the way that everyone's been building this product has been do take this item, turn it to this, do this process, do this process. So there's a big map of how things have been done before to get from raw materials to this product. Maybe that's a car, maybe the raw materials is or, you know, aluminum and iron and lithium. So the first principle thinking is start here and say, our goal is to get these atoms to look like this and make that your, your goal. And then sometimes that allows you to bypass a lot of the things that people have done before to get there because you're willing to start at the beginning again. So for me, starting at the beginning with respect to protecting yourself, from getting pulled over, getting put in jail, getting sent letters from the IRS or someone else that wants to threaten you, um, paying property taxes, all those things. The, the lowest level of that was um, the fact that for me, the worst thing I've ever had the government do or ever really heard of them doing out in the open is they send people letters and they put people in jail. Ultimately, the rest of the stuff that goes on is like not supposed to happen and it's like undercover and, you know, the chemtrails, no one admits to that shit. But the stuff that they admit to is they send you letters, or at least the common knowledge, they'll send you letters and they'll put you in jail. So if I have a protection union that makes it so that I'm no longer worried about going to jail because my protection union makes sure that that doesn't happen, then I could probably just ignore the letters. Who cares about the letters? As long as I'm going to jail and paying for anything, probably fine. Um, but we could have a protection union that takes care of the letters too, you know, send a reply. I do not consent, no contract, whatever, send them back. So yeah, that's how I, I that's how I thought through or initially thought about protecting my system was that. So even if we don't own the land, even if we don't buy the land, even if in, in any scenario, if we've got a protection union, it doesn't matter, right? And I'm not saying we shouldn't buy the land. I think uh, for me, I think that it's more right for me to buy the land than to just take the land. That's what I think. So I propose doing that. But once you buy it, you should be allowed to buy it you should be allowed to own property. Whereas property taxes say otherwise, property taxes say you will never own your land because we want you to continue to give us dollars. Well, a dead man can't give you dollars. So how's he supposed to own, your, own the land? Okay, well maybe dead people can't. Well, what about a, a Bitcoin blockchain? Bitcoin blockchain can't pay his taxes because Bitcoin blockchain doesn't have a hand and it doesn't have any US dollars. So what can it do? It could send bitcoins to the county, but the county would probably refuse it. So anyway, even if you didn't own the land, what's the worst thing that would happen? You know, you could have the military come bomb you. That would be pretty bad. I tend to believe that the military is not going to try and stop us. As much as, as, much as that, um, we could do things there that would make them want to stop us, but I don't intend to build a system or encourage any activities that would make 
the army try and stop us. I, I think that they're not interested in just stopping people from living their lives. I think they're more interested in other things. But the local, the local authorities, the police officer, the sheriff, the county commissioner, they're interested in stopping you. So this is just, this is just going on forever. But anyway, <laughs> so I can chime in here. Terms. Go ahead. Um, well, I mean, you've covered a lot of ground. Um, you know, uh, it, well, and that, that's fine. Um, you know, started kind of small with the, uh, or I guess kind of high, high level with the, uh, with the ideal religion and then, you know, talked about the, your greenhouses, your under, underground greenhouses. Um, I guess one of the things that, it, you know, it instantly caught my attention about the greenhouses um, was I, I had a similar thought. Um, well, here in Midwest Nebraska, the, the, the farmers had uh, like, they have these things called irrigation pivots where they're just these huge sprinklers. And right. I was like, if you, if you could build a good size, strong and stable, uh, you know, structure over two legs of that, or even just one, you know, um, or you, there's probably a cheaper way to do it too, but essentially, you know, like a mimic their watering system. Um, and then, then, it, then, it, okay. I guess this idea started or originated from imagining what I would do with that land <laughs> if it were mine. Right. Um, and so, and so it'd be doing that. It would be converting the, this mass agriculture, you know, this big ag land to, uh, you know, uh, uh, horticulture and, 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 uh, you know, uh, farming by hand, uh, which, you, you know, a, a simple recipe to me seems, you know, greenhouses that can go year, year round, like you mentioned, and the underground, that seems like it might work out real well. Um, but that in a school, I think those with, with the right, religion uh that would attract you know the people you're looking for or at least uh you know it, it seems like it it coalesces yeah that's cool i i didn't think too much in terms of what the school would need to be but um i wanted to have some artificial hot springs in one of the units um but yeah the there would be community center units and there definitely should be a school um at very least, kids should run around like they did in Huckleberry Finn or something and have a good time with other kids their age and run around in a safe environment where no one's afraid of disappearing um, or getting injured badly. So yeah, the in terms of building that community out more than the base level of a unit where you can stay and live, yeah, that needs to be built out. Um, some people have asked me this question, and I think more people have the same question. They they ask how it's going to be managed and who's going to do what. And, and the thing is, I am hoping to organize, I'm hoping to get the right people in the right place. And I don't actually have any expectation of managing anyone because I think when the right people are in the right place, I think it just, they do what they need to do. Like it's not, it's not going to be, like it needs a top-down approach. Once you and your friend, that's your best friend, get together, you don't need an event planner. Like you can do your own stuff. You can figure out your life. You don't need someone to tell you what to do, how to live or any of it. So my goal isn't necessarily to have any say or influence over what people do. I mean, that's the beauty of it is them doing what they wanna do and building what they build my influence hopefully will be to create a platform where they can find each other, the people that are really meant to be together and that they'll do that. And I believe that for every single person, you get along with people and appreciate socializing with people that really get you. And the people that really get you are probably like your personality clone will probably get you been through the same shit in their life been through the same ups and downs, you know, they've had a great life, they've had whatever, you know, they have similar number of kids, they married a similar type of personality, they grew up a certain similar way, they see the world a similar way, whatever it, whatever it happens to be where, uh, I mean, not any of those items that I mentioned is going to really mean that they understand you, but let's say they do fully see you, fully understand you, and one way for them to do that is for them to be basically your clone, you know, they've done this, 
their life's been real similar to yours. Okay, that's my first layer, first level of assuming that people that will get together will enjoy being together. So the first level is that, hey, if they're similar to you, you'll probably get along pretty well because you'll probably understand each other. Now that's only layer one because layer one is, that's a very simple metric. Although it might be extremely difficult to do, hard to find people that are similar, that's the goal, right? But the that's a simple metric. Beyond that, then you have some other design that if you're if you're a musician and you're you're writing a song, you don't just want the song to be one note, you know, one instrument, one note. Instead, you might want throughout the song different notes at different times from different instruments and combinations of instruments. That's what needs to happen ultimately. And I hope that I can get enough. Uh, I hope that enough musicians and artists and energy workers um, will do that part once we get a platform built. Once there's enough people involved, I think 10 million people involved would be enough where you could find 100 people that were good, like really, really good for you. And those, the people in your friend group, those 100 people that were most well matched for you, they would change over time and in, in the sense that uh, you would have different people coming in and out of that group that's your closest friends right your best friends because some of your best friends would grow in a different direction than the group does and you might grow in a different direction than that group does so your group is going to change and you're going to move closer and farther from whatever group there was but ultimately the group is going to uh you're going to be in a group that matches you well hopefully from here indefinitely until you decide or choose that you don't any longer want to be next to your best friend, I guess. Or if the algorithm stops working, then that would be a problem. But yeah, that's the, that's what I'm trying to get at. And, and what people do in their communities to answer your question about schools and different things. Yeah, there should definitely be cool things in each community. And why not? If you're next to your best friends, aren't you going to do cool stuff? Like, that's what I plan to do <laughs> with my best friends. I just need to find a hundred of them that are willing to, that are actually well matched, you know, out of 10 million. Like that's a, that's a tall order and I hope we can do it. Yeah. Great man. Great man. Um, Chris, do you have, uh, any follow-ups there? Oh, I guess I got a lot. I'm just not sure which way to go. Um, Hey, wherever, wherever you're I feeling, probably, man. you know, wherever you're feeling, go for it. I probably should go. Yeah. I should go out where the, uh, disagreements might lie or where, where we might differ in our, in our perspectives and opinions. Um, let's see. Well, I guess I'll lead off by saying the, uh, attractive thing about Vanu to me, and I know we're, we're, I guess, yeah, crossbreeding Vanu with, um, with the second realm. Uh, uh, but I would, I would argue that the second realm is going to require some Vanuans to, to, discipline uh themselves and, and, and achieve uh some high some high mths to secure various natures of what will be required to establish something meaningful for lack of more clear terms um so i like i guess one thing i'm always reminded of or always thinking about is the coercion and and that mth and, and how to uh keep that in mind uh, it's the mean time to harassment mentioned by Rayo, um, published by Rayo Squared. Um, so the mean time to harassment is basically uh, is an algorithm that that Rayo uh, came up with uh, to calculate uh, how invulnerable to coercion, how much how much invulnerability to coercion you've achieved. Uh, Very good. So. Uh, so, so you know, I guess uh, you know uh, what Chief chimed in with with how to, uh, uh, I guess, I guess the trying to strike the you know the the uh, the root of the problem like you know uh, the loyal title or the the uh, where to go, 
pages of notes here. Oh yeah, the land patents and all that. Um, you know, that's good information. Um, you know, because you, you might be able to slow them down and make it look good on paper. But uh, I just I want to thoroughly remind everybody that uh, it's not like a magic wall is created by a piece of paper or um, you know that, that that actually means anything to uh, a group of organized criminals, right? Um, if that land ever uh, gains attention from the bludge, um, you know, that's, that's the, the pieces of paper aren't going to mean much. Right. Um, so I, I guess I just wanted to put that out there and as, as uh, my considerations when uh, considering the longevity and seriousness of, or, you know, the effectiveness of, of an organization like you're describing, you know, um, can it also, you know, be invulnerable to that harassment? That's great. That's great. That's how I like. That's how I like to think about it. The uh, first principles thinking. That's what came up with me. Even without any laws, there's there's times, and I've seen this before. There's times when someone will go to a restaurant and they'll have a bad experience and they won't go back. And if we if we were a police officer and we went to a community and it felt very vulnerable for us to be be in there because there was only one entrance and we drive in with our police car and there's only one way in and out and now you've got 30 eyes on you 30 people staring at you and you're one police officer in there and you're trying to deliver a message or tell, talk to someone or tell them that they they need to you know get a, a septic system or whatever, whatever you're going to try and do to harass them. You're walking into a very vulnerable situation and you're going to try and harass somebody. Now it's going to feel, it's got to feel bad. I can just imagine like what I would feel like walking in there and you don't know whether they got guns. You don't know what they're going to do. Maybe everyone just walks out, they strip down butt naked and they walk out and walk toward him. That would be weird. Wouldn't it? Weird and uncomfortable. If it, if it turns to, out to be a bad experience, you might not go back there, even if your police chief tells you to, even if you're supposed to, even if you have to lie and say you went and they told you no. Whatever you're going to fucking do, if it's bad enough and nothing has to be illegal for it to be bad, just like there's nothing illegal that happened in that restaurant that made you hate it and never want to go back. Maybe you had a bad piece of ham. Maybe the, the waiter was having a bad day. Maybe uh, whatever happened. But you freak the fuck out in the restaurant and the owner comes over and they're like, what the hell, you know, and no matter how it goes down, even if you're the one that says all the mean words and have the last word and you stomp out of there, oh, I showed them, I showed them. But do you go back to that restaurant? No. Why would you go back? Oh, I have a right to be back at that restaurant. Even during the mask pandemia shit. You go into a place and they harass you enough about your mask. You know, you could go to Walmart instead where they don't harass you. <laughs> you could go somewhere where they don't harass you. So although you might think the law's on my side, I'm the one that's right. I, ha I got the last word, like blah, blah, blah. You could still end up with a feeling of, of a negative karma, negative feelings, negative experience, and choose to never go back there. That's my vision for a police officer that shouldn't be there. I'm not talking about anyone does anything illegal if we care about laws. I don't think laws are important. I think doing what's right is important, but I don't think laws are important. So who cares about laws? But it would be wrong for us to say, oh, you're on our land. We have a right to shoot you. We're going to shoot you. That would be wrong. But, you know, pissing on the guy, fucking throwing shit at him, that's not wrong. That's fucking, he's in the wrong place. Why is he even there? You know? Maybe he'll have a bad time and he'll leave. So that's the, that's the way I think about it. Um, but it could get worse, you know, it could escalate or whatever. But another way to resolve differences is uh, you take their time, they take your time. You know, like, we're going to both go sit down and we're going to have a discussion and we're going to resolve this. And if I'm willing to spend 50 hours sitting on my ass in a chair in a, in a meeting room, you know, filibuster style, 
then he's got to be willing to do the same thing. Whoever leaves first loses. Okay, no one's harmed. Nothing wrong happens. Everything's great. We all get our our differences handled, and uh, it, no one he had to even get you know pissed on. And there's different options for this to happen, but you have to be willing, and you have to have kind of a group because if you're by yourself and you're not willing, then you get to be a slave or you get to die. You get two choices at that point. But if you join a group that agrees with you and you're willing to add to that group you're willing to participate in that protection union, then you have a third option. But most of us are sitting with two options, obey or choose to not live in this world anymore. I mean, there's a third option, which is the right option. The right option is do whatever the hell you want. That's the right option. But some of us have a little bit of like forethought in our actions. And uh, when we when we get thinking about what, the consequences could be of our actions, then uh, we might realize that, you know, you got two options at that point. But if you got, if you use your third option, that's the best option. You should just do that. Everyone should. What's next? Protection union is, oh, I never got to that part. So when I thought through what types of organizations don't need to be registered to, to have legitimacy, I thought what type of organization do we as the general populace consider to be a legitimate, valid organization, even if, and I'm using these words loosely from my own vocabulary, not from a dictionary, but what kind of organizations don't need to be registered to be real and valid for people to say, oh no, that's a real organization. Well, <coughs> gangs don't. I mean, I wonder why they don't have to be registered. I don't know, probably because what they're up to is against the law, so no, they would get their registration pulled. They would get their license pulled for whatever they're trying to do. So that's understandable. The type of business that they're in makes it so they can't be registered. Okay, fine, right? I guess that's what's happening with me too. I wanna be in a business that's durable and scalable and lasts a long time and does a lot of good for a long time and can't be shut down by, by evil bureaucrat, bureaucrats. All right, so mine it lands in the same place i don't want it to be registered but uh it's different what i'm trying to do is good and what the gangs try to do might not be good right we associate gangs with nefarious activity and uh negative results we also have another one mafia a mafia you could say it needs to be registered but i would probably say from the way i was raised i thought mafias didn't need to be registered but they could still be viewed as a legitimate organization that you should really you know if you just want to believe that the bloods and the crypts don't exist fine but it's at your peril right so what is it that gives them their legitimacy without permission without a government what gives them legitimacy it's the fact that they can hold their own the fact that they can enforce their contracts without paper without courts they can still enforce their contracts so that's that's where I started to come to the idea of, hey, um, mafia, you know, and then I realized maybe, maybe a union, like a, an employment union, workers union, they might not be registered either because a lot of times there's so much political um, corruption when there's a big business that it would be helpful if there was a union for those workers, but the big business doesn't want the union. Well, the big business has deep pockets and probably has politicians. So that's another type of organization that I don't know if they're registered. I think most of them are registered. So most of them could get their license pulled or their permit removed or their registration revoked. I think that's how it is nowadays, but I could see why they might be unregistered, not registered, okay? And then that's where we got some other uh, examples from Chris that like a township or an unregistered un, un, unincorporated location could also be no, no one had to ask permission to make it happen. So anyway, I think that the, the kindest, most accurate term is protection union. I coined it myself. I would, I mean, between me and God, right. But, uh, but that's basically what it is. And, and it's not like, an organization, one organization. It's a concept. Like when I say a church, you know, there's not one church, 
but a church, a protection union is a concept that I think everyone should, if they wish to survive, uh, it, it, it's not a bad strategy. That's why, because your protection union could help you. They could be there for you. They could get you out of jail if you get put in jail. They could, if police officers want to pull you over, you could get your buddies and go pull the police officer over when he's off the clock. You know, I don't want to pull him over when he's on the clock. He's getting paid. He pulled me over when I wasn't getting paid. I want a level playing field. I don't need a million dollars from the, the county by suing him for putting me in jail. I want to go take his ass and put it in our custody, put it in jail. Why? Level playing field is better because the people that play the game on the corporate side have unlimited money. They have deep pockets. They have, they're getting paid to do what they do to harass people. To me, that's not, it's not going to work to just fight them in court and win. I don't think personally that's the way to go because i think that's their game and that's them playing it and them making the rules i think if it's going to be fair they made a game they made the rules they conscripted me into following their rules and playing their game i make a game i make the rules i can script them into following my rules level playing field and it's probably time that we do that as people of the world <clears throat> And I, and I welcome other people's uh, thinking on how to make that happen, but I'm, I'm pro level playing field. So I was going to mention just real quickly, um, cause it, this has come up in the Paznia chat before. Um, but the, uh, cause we did, uh, I did a building the second realm series series on uh, the Vanya podcast. And one of those episodes was, you know, lessons from organized crime. And, uh, in the book, second round book on strategy, there is a chapter, um, and, and, um, smuggler and XYZ say, quote, the mafia as an example is primarily a loose net network of independent gangs that pay tribute to their dons and receive protection in their own conflict, res conflict resolution system and return. <clears throat> Their aim is to limit conflict within groups and not resort to violence when other means of conflict res resolution are available. They operate their own title system of territories and markets. They provide services for, uh, for communication and reputation, and they foster the division of labor through specialization. One could define the mafia as an organized crime business association based on a shared ethical background. Um, so obviously they provide the disclaimer that, yeah, as, as, you have as you have too, that usually they don't do very, you know, um, uh, they don't participate in the most, you know, ethical behaviors a lot of times. Um, but as far as the strategies, we can learn, um, you know, we can learn from them and, and apply them as we can to, uh, you know, for the positive per se. So, um, yeah, you aren't, you definitely aren't the first one to make that comparison, um, <clears throat> in that sense. So, um, yeah, I guess I'll turn it over to Chris or you guys, if you have anything further or anyone else. Yeah, I guess um, I think it's it's worth at least stating this at some point. I got better get out there sooner than later. Um, and I guess this is just my my own opinion and vision. Um, I don't think the second realm can be uh, built by uh, creating comfortable, like you, you mentioned, being um, not you know uh, being led into your comfort zone, which isn't necessarily good. And I think we can be led into our comfort zone especially if people are trying to help us be become uh, dependent on them. Right. And, and I think a second or uh, a certain part of the second realm has to be built by independent, independent people that are willing to stand on their own two feet um, without a crowd. Um, right. And I, I just want to emphasize that, that we need a, a, a coterie of strong individuals to, to make a, a, a strong chain. Yeah, yeah, I certainly agree with that. Yeah, like, like and, and you might be uh, like, uh, there might be two different ways of thinking about this. Um, you know, where one, uh, in terms of Anu, comes down to political crusading, trying to, uh, you know, uh, just to convert people and and use them for your benefit, or at least, you know, disconnect them from the benefit of your enemies. Um, you know, and so the political crusading versus, you know, um, taking care of things in the local and, and, and now as practically po as, as possible and building. Right. And yeah, just, I guess just bring it back home to that. just a little bit closer, you know, to, um, uh, so we can have, it sh sh kind of see a vision 
of, of, of the short term. And I guess I, I would say that is, is building a place uh, with resources that, that's inviting and useful uh, to you know, like-minded individuals. Right. Um, that's one thing I'm not doing because I don't have the uh, it, it's, it's not my position to uh, lay claim to land. And so people that are willing to do that, I'm very reliant upon you. <laughs> so. Yeah, we have land. <laughs> and it's ready for people. Yeah. So, so maybe that, so maybe that's a, a good, we've been going for like two hours and 10 minutes and I know I'm, I'm, it's it my, I'm actually getting a little hungry, so might be moving towards dinner. But anyway, um, I guess I, um, I want to emphasize this point again, we talked about it in the podcast, but, um, you've got the land and you're, you've read, you're ready for people to, uh, you know, come out now. So I guess, um, yeah, I guess tell people about that again. Yeah. So I have land and I have, um, I have it available for purchase if people want to buy. So I have, um, I've offered it for purchase because I think that people are more familiar with buying something that they can have and that they can have full control over. So I'm offering that with the intention that I'll just get more people because there's some people that would love to in, love to engage, but they'd like to see it first. So the closest thing they're willing to do is buy something that they know is theirs. Whereas the true vision is for me to not necessarily own any of these pieces, or maybe I own one, but I don't live there. I live using the timeshare system. So the, the for purchase option is, uh, they're at about $8,000, I think right now. The, the price goes up 1% per month and it's set to $10,000 in January of 2026. So we can prorate forward or backward using that 1% per month um, appreciation rate. Um, anyway, so that's, you would get basically the equivalent of what will one day become one of these greenhouses. So it's three or 4,000 square feet and you would buy that for $8,000 and you, it would be yours, you could keep it. The next option is you buy one with a few restrictions. It's still yours, but you grant us back the right to eminent domain you out of it when it comes time and just pay you to, to basically um, have you upgrade. So what that means is you're not gonna put, you're not gonna build any permanent structure on it. You're going to live there in maybe RV or something and this is land that still is not inside of a greenhouse yet. Um, but you would basically live without putting permanent structures on it. And it would be the same price. What you would also get by, uh, by granting us the right to uh, one day buy it back from you, giving us the option to buy it back from you, then you would get, uh, in your price, you would get water. So we would provide, um, we're not gonna dig one well for each one. We're just gonna send pipes to each one. But you'll be you'll get like 200 gallons a day of water, which is enough to live in an RV and grow crops. So inside of a greenhouse, you can't water that your whole garden. But like if you had a greenhouse that you set up that you could easily take down, and you had your RV, then you could fill up. You could take 200 gallons a day from the community water supply. So that's option number two, same price. And then options number three and four are. Uh, uh, basically the upgrade options. Once we get these things built, then you would just upgrade from wherever you're at. You would say, okay, great. Let me upgrade them and buy one of the units that's actually climate controlled. It's got the water supply. It never rains in there. Uh, you, I mean, except for your own sprinkler if you want, but, but it's ready to go. So that's the, that's the options right now. So you could pre-order something that's going to be built. Um, and also if you buy one of the lots, then you get first pick, you're first in line for when we get, actually get these things built. And likely if you buy and you come out and live on it, then you'll likely help us build them. And all of the time that it takes to build these units, we're, we're tracking instead of in terms of dollars, the cost to build, we're tracking in terms of man hours um, or minutes actually of labor. So one minute of labor equals one, st 
stake, which is the timeshare unit in our system. And that will, once you, once you're credited with having worked that minute, right? Once it's on, once it's lodged into the, block, the blockchain, this minute goes to this wallet, you know, this guy did this work, then you'll start earning points on that, uh, which is 1% per month that will go toward you being able to rent the future assets. So, so when I say upgrade, I mean, you would then be able to buy enough stake that you could own one of these things uh, in terms of the timeshare style. It's also a thing where if you wanted to own one of those greenhouses and you didn't want to participate in the timeshare, you just wanted to own it. Well, what's going to happen is we're going to have a section that is designated for people that wanted that. So what that means is there's a risk for you. If you buy one of those, you're going to have to sell it again to someone else if you no longer want it. And you're not going to be able to have neighbors that are well matched for you. You're going to have neighbors that were of the same temperament when they bought that they wanted to own, right? So there's not really as much benefit in terms of community, but there is benefit in terms of feeling like you own it. You never have to move. It's yours forever. No property taxes. No one's coming to take your stuff. Uh, you don't have any other obligations once you've bought it. So what I'm saying is that all of those types of units will be grouped together. Um, probably right next to all the other units, right? There's a, this in Beaver where I'm at, um, the one that's close to my house, seven minutes from Beaver, there's only 24 units there. But the other location is next to a place called Utah OSR. It's an off-grid community in Utah that is playing more by the rules, the legal rules. They use lawyers and stuff. Um, like not that way. So, um, but it's near that community. They're all an off-grid community and they're building, they're doing things. It's going to be an agricultural co-op. I bought 40 acres just north of that. And there's going to be 192 plots there that are 4,000 square foot each. And then there's all of the easement space between where we build the dirt walls and stuff, because that's not really useful property to you. But, but it is what keeps the wind out and keeps your place um, warm and stuff. That's how it goes. So those are the two options right now. We are open to acquiring more land, and but we don't really need to do that until we can get something built here first. So, but yeah, I don't well, have, so, uh, go ahead. Yeah, th thanks for thanks for sharing that, Rex. Um, you know, I appreciate those, those details. I guess, um, you know, it sounds like you have a lot to offer. Um, I'd be more interested presently to, you know, consider uh, trying it before I buy it. Um, and I don't mean to disingenuously portray as if I'm interested in buying. I'm, I'm more interested in transient relationships myself, um, but it sounds like it could it could work something like that. Um, but I'd be curious if you know maybe uh, as you're going, you know, I could, somebody like me could stop out and and help you build um, without necessarily any other obligation beyond helping out. Awesome, yeah, that's welcome. It's just I'm not really out there building yet. I've got some tractors, but I don't have. Uh, I'm not like ready to put my arms and legs to work yet <laughs> i need more people it's kind of tough doing it by myself <laughs> so we're gonna get there we're close but we're not there yet where like it would make sense to have someone come for a week and help um but if they came for a week they can stay there and they're welcome to stay there and i would love to meet with them and go camping with them on the on the property so um everyone's still welcome it's just i can't say that i'll have a lot of useful work for you to do while you're here but um uh, once we do get going, there will be work for people to do all the time. We're just going to be <laughs> repeating the same structure over and over 24 different times, or it's going to be insane. Cool. It, it's, it's a project. And once we are happy with the results then we'll open source the design, not that it's not open source right now, anyone can come talk to me about it, but, um, we will hopefully refine it to the point where we're happy to. Um, encourage people around the world to do the same thing in their country and we will give them support, you know, engineering support and financial support, legal support to help them get that done. And then once they've built it in their country, it'll get added into the 
the mix to the map. It'll probably all end up on the Pasmia map as well, Second Realm map, because mm -hmm. I think that the two projects are so closely related that uh, that it'll just be listed there as uh, yeah, you can stay here, spend your spend your points here. Yeah. Most definitely, that was uh, that was going to be my 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 comments here for um, you know for the folks here and also for the uh, podcast audience and listeners out there. But uh, yeah, this is a uh, um, a great option. Even yeah, even if you do get you know put next to people who may not necessarily be your neighbors, this is just a great option for nomadic manuans. Another place you can stop, uh, another pocket of freedom per se. And uh, uh, and as he said, for those in the Pasni network too. Um, so I'm I'm happy to hear your your um, um, yeah these will be could potentially be added to the map whenever we we get more around to that and. Um, yeah, awesome, awesome. Uh, any anything else? Any other questions or uh, um, comments by anyone else? <clears throat> Maybe not. <clears throat> okay. Well, uh, I guess um, I'll close it out there then. Um, thanks uh, everyone for coming to the second Pasnia. Uh, Second Realm Assembly. It was uh, was fantastic, uh, definitely fantastic. And um, you know, I like the Telegram um, option here. Uh, I like I love Jitsi, obviously, but um, this is uh, pretty convenient to uh, get together and uh, <clears throat> yeah, get together and chat. Um, very convenient. So maybe we'll do these more regularly here, regu regularly here on Telegram. And uh, but obviously we'll have to do um, like our passing Department of Technology meetings. We'll probably have to do those over on Jitsi because uh, I'm not sure Jamin's on Telegram. Um, so, uh, we definitely need to have him on that consultation. So, um, yeah, those might be on Jitsi, but otherwise I, I, yeah, I do like this, uh, the, the telegram platform. Um, I guess I will, uh, just close out, um, today for, to promote it, for, uh, promoting this, I put out a little one minute promo, um, on uh, YouTube and Odyssey. And, uh, it was a quote that, uh, bastard Chris put in the Pasnia chat, uh, I guess a few days back. Um, but there was another one I was going to toss out there. Um, that's, uh, and I don't even know how to pronounce, pronounce this, so forgive me, but Zochipili, Zochipili, um, said that, quote, the second realm is not just a dream, it is an action. It is simply the most rational way to approach this insane system of enslavement we have somehow inherited. The odds of success at a societal level is beside the point. A higher degree of morality, freedom, and autonomy are in our own lives. For ourselves, our family, and immediate community is something that is always practical, practical for us to aspire to, uh, end quote. Um, so yeah, I think that's fantastic to, uh, to close out on for today. Um, yeah, Pasnia.com if you want more information or if you want to join the Second Realm. And uh, VanuPodcast.com for all things Vanu. And um, yeah, I guess uh, close it out there. Anyone, anyone else have any closing, any parting thoughts? I mean, I can throw out my, my handle here. So mm -hmm. on Telegram, my direct uh, personal handle is Rexated, R-E-X-A-T-E-D. And uh, the, the We Church, which is kind of the, the intention holding body for this project is uh w c d a o we church dao um, so that's that's like the intention arm and then the implementation of the algorithm is like the community dao and the implementation of the asset management is the asset dao perfect fantastic uh chris anything else uh give, give everyone kind of one one final option one final shot here Okay. I don't think so. Okay. All right. We'll close it out there. Um, thanks everyone for coming and uh, we'll catch you next time. Cheers from the Free Republic. Thank you. Thank you.